That's why we provide different internet solutions for your different needs. SLT Fiber, 4G and ADSL. SLT Broadband, just the way you want it. Tonight, no mercy. President Maithripala Sirisena says that drug traffickers should be sentenced to death, calls for a strict implementation of the capital punishment. The head of state also calls people safeguarding the rights of drug criminals as traitors of the nation. Hold it or I'll quit. Election Commission Chairman Mahinda Deshapriya had some choice words for the government. Issues an ultimatum calling for provincial council elections to be held before November 2019 or else he'll quit. Flying stable. Central Bank Governor tells Reuters that investor confidence in Sri Lanka is steadily growing after Sri Lanka paid a billion dollar bond. Defining the West. As Venezuela's two presidents face off, children scavenge for food and soldiers run out of patience. Meanwhile, President Maduro tells US and EU diplomats, get out of Venezuela tonight, Monday, the 28th of January, 2019. From other Verona. Smart Android Park Shrinin in a Singer Vista TV Kak Miladika now butter. Hit the Piren Vasi Rasak. On Emma Singer Pradashanagariki. This is Other Verona first at nine. With Ndivaria Muwata and Mahish Jani. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. And a very good evening and welcome to Other Than a 24 and to First at Nine. Hope you have a wonderful day and we're beginning another new week. Ndivaria, good evening. Certainly, how was your weekend? Uh, it was quite good actually. Uh, quite interesting, slept right. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, interesting news unfolding over the weekend. And of course today we have uh, the report of the Sri Lankan Airlines Committee that probed into losses made by the state-owned national carrier. And also um, we do have the central bank chief uh, reiterating the ability of our meeting our debt repayment uh, it's, I, it was one of our headline stories as well. We're going to get into that and also internationally. Venezuela is uh, deepening its crisis where the West is apparently saying, you know, hold elections now and the president of uh, uh, Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro, says that's not going to happen. Right. Will this plunge the world into another crisis? Now, that's a question we'd like to talk about after uh, later on during our uh, international news. But we begin with our headline-making stories. A drug-free country has been one of the most important initiatives carried out by the current government, an initiative championed by President Maitripala Sirisena himself. Island-wide police raids continue in an attempt to bring those who are responsible before justice. And it is in this backdrop that the head of state reiterated that the death penalty must be implemented against those who are responsible for drug-related offences. President Sirisena said this addressing the Janapati Prashansa Award Ceremony. Janapati Prashansa, Didas Dhanavir. The Janapati Prashansa Award Ceremony to felicitate police officers who played a significant role in making the concept of a drug-free nation a reality was held under the patronage of President Maitri Pala Sirisena today. Over 100,000 police officers who were actively involved in dangerous drug raids and prevention operations during the period from January 14, 2015 to January 14, 2019 were felicitated under the three awards categories, the Presidential Medal of Police Galantry, Sri Lanka Police Galantry Medal and the Janadipati Prashansa Certifications. I emphasize to you that the era of officers in charge being transferred as a result of influence of those who commit illegal activities is now over. As the minister under whose purview the police department falls, I will issue an order calling for specific reasons for a transfer of a police officer to be mentioned in the official transfer letter, similar to the special unit for drug prevention and the emergency number 1984 dedicated to to report incidents related to narcotics and illegal drug trafficking, I will introduce 
separate unit to report incidents related to unethical transfers of police officers. This country doesn't have any of the high-tech equipment used by other nations in handling narcotic raids. If we did have these equipments, we would have already been rid of the drug menace. Death penalty must be imposed on those drug traffickers. Maraniya dandanaya dia yutu mai, dia yutu mai. Those who argue for the human rights of criminals, underworld figures and drug traffickers must be upheld and identified as traitors of the nation. I will obtain cabinet approval for a paper tomorrow on establishing an authority on reforming drug addicts. Now, the chairman of the Election Commission, Mahinda Deshapre, today threatened to resign from his position if the government fails to hold provincial council elections before November. Deshapre lambasted the government over the delay in polls while saying that the election process is currently deadlocked. His heavy criticism echoed the sentiments of numerous politicians and civil society activists who have been shining a spotlight on the importance of holding provincial council polls as soon as possible. How delayed is this provincial council election by now? This is a violation of the democracy. Delaying of an election is as bad as holding a corrupt election in the country. But everyone says that we don't care about this matter. Against whom the election commission must go to courts? Courts will most probably let the commission know that it will act on the matter accordingly and the case will eventually be dismissed. That's why we said that any affected party or an individual can go to the court so that we can argue saying the process of passing the bill on this election is at a deadlock. And following these arguments, if the court rules that delaying of the election in fact is a violation of democracy, the commission can move ahead with holding the election. But then we hope that all 225 parliamentarians along with the President and Prime Minister as well as Speaker will resolve this unsolvable problem. In the previous case where I went to court, there was a very specific law that was being violated. In this particular case, Parliament has been negligent, but no law has been violated for me to go and say, so there is nothing Who's to challenge. Parliament is dodging. What more can we do about this anymore? As the chairman of the election commission, I never raised my concerns at the commission or with its members. Never uttered a word at my home. We won't be able to do anything if they hold the presidential election earlier than expected. But if they don't hold the provincial council election until the presidential election is being held during the period from 9th of November to 9th of December, I will resign from my post. <laughs> In other headline stories, the country's national carrier Sri Lankan Airlines has been shrouded in controversy for some time, with corruption allegations leveled against some of its members of its past hierarchy being a concern of great proportions. Following backlash, President Matrapala Sivisena on the 7th of this month appointed a committee to obtain suggestions on restructuring Sri Lankan Airlines and to make recommendations. The 12-member committee today submitted their report to the President recommending the head of state that the debt of the carrier be restructured while also recommending to raise capital to take the airline forward. The committee appointed to obtain suggestions on restructuring Sri Lankan Airlines submitted its report with recommendations to President Matipala Sirisena at the Presidential Secretariat today. The committee was appointed by the President on the 7th of January. The 12-member committee, chaired by State Minister Eran Vikramaratna, included Dr. Harsha De Silva, Dr. Nandalal Veerasinghe, Dr. Dharmaratna Herath, Professor D.B.P.H. Disabandara, V. Kanagasabhapathy, LSI Jayaratna, Viraj Dayaratna, Mahen Gopallava, Vasanta Kumarasiri, Ajit Amarsekara and Thissuri Vanyarachi. The committee had looked at liquidating the airline and management agreement. Chairman of the committee stated, the uh, chairman of the committee, State Minister Ron Vikramaratna, however, had recommended the president that debt restructuring and capital raising seems to be the most suitable option.
and the Central Bank Chief Dr. Indrajit Kumaraswamy told Reuters today that investor confidence in Sri Lanka is stabilizing after the island nation repaid a $1 billion sovereign bond in mid-January. As a result of political chaos, investor sentiment took a big hit, leading to credit rating downgrades and an outflow of foreign funds from government securities. Kumaraswamy was quoted as saying to Reuters that signs of stabilization uh, in investor confidence is seen, especially after Sri Lanka paid the loan without much difficulty, but there is much more to be done. Sri Lanka repaid the $1 billion five-year sovereign bond on January 14th, and the International Monetary Fund decided on January 16th to resume discussions with Sri Lanka over the dispersal of a part of the $1.5 billion loan, a string of events which are thought to have helped improve sentiment. Now the government is struggling to repay its foreign loans with a record $5.9 billion due to mature this year, including $2.6 billion in the first three months alone. Earlier this month, Dr. Kumaraswamy said that the Sri Lankan government plans to borrow nearly $5 billion through sovereign bonds, a bilateral loan from China, a currency swap with the Reserve Bank of India and through three state banks. Well, uh, as we spoke about these debt obligations, a question is whether the series of credit rating downgrades following the political crisis made, uh, whether it has made it harder for Sri Lanka to borrow. But again, uh, the governor was quoted as saying to the Nikkei Asian Review in an interview on Thursday that Sri Lanka is on course to avert a balance of payments crisis this year, expressing confidence in the island nation's ability to secure um, aid from both China and India to repay, uh, repay these loans. Now, Mahesh, I think to discuss more on this, we have a prominent uh, economist, Dr. Um, or Mr. Tissa Jayavira. Good evening and a warm welcome. Good evening to you, Um Well, Mr. Jayavira, like we were talking about Sri Lankan Airlines and also the governor's uh, continued reassurance that Sri Lanka is in a position to repay our external debt obligations. But again, let's start off with these rating downgrades. Uh, with these downgrades, hasn't um, the world, hasn't, haven't we sent uh, signals of um, uh, instability or some sort of chaos within the country? How is Sri Lanka going to uh, make a U-turn from this? Okay, the initial news was bad for mm -hmm. us, right? But then we need positive news to take the country forward, mm -hmm. as long as it is a truth. So we have to give the positive news to the world that we are not a bankrupt country, neither will we go bankrupt, but we are putting our things right. So positive news by everybody is very important. These days, it's only a few people like the Governor Central Bank who comes out with positive news, but everybody else is criticizing this country. We are cutting our own grave by talking nonsense without knowing the actual facts. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, of what, what are the actual uh, facts, Mr. Jayavir? What's right for us? What should we Sri Lanka do? Well, talk positive because, uh, say, we have never been a nation that has gone on the reverse other than for one year when suddenly it was uh, said that we have negative growth. But then at that time, the figures were all concocted to show positive. And when there was uh, indication that the governments will, the, the governments will change, the central bank reversed this story. So that kind of thing is very bad for this country. So we have to talk the facts, and we are in a desperate situation right now. But we have to plan and get out of the situation in a, in a positive manner. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, Mr. Javier, what you're saying is that the messaging which has been done by the government in stating what is exactly happening in this country is poor. I, I, they are not taking the message across to our investors abroad or, or people who is who's willing to uh, invest here in Sri Lanka. So what exactly can we do in order to make sure that, you know, this is not what we should be continuously saying, but, you know, pointing out the good things that they can could do, especially like if you take the tourism industry. That is, that is a positive uh, uh, area which we can actually invest. And yet the message is not going through to the investors, uh, you know, the other other... Uh, events that occur here locally shrouds all that. 
Yeah, you took a good point. Now, see, tourism industry is an industry that is totally controlled by the private sector. Okay, people come here. And then we should encourage the people coming here with saying that how nice we are. Mm -hmm. And then it's the foreign media and the foreign uh, journalists and the foreign uh, advertisers that are giving the positive news. But we as a country don't give positive news. It is always negative. Don't come here. Now the government is going to fall and things like that. Well, it doesn't affect the middle income tourists. They go, even if there is war, they will go. But then we are hit by the high economic, high spending tourists don't want to go into areas where there is conflict and confusion. But that market now, see our market is totally uh, controlled or not controlled, but totally contribution comes by the middle income tourists. That's the majority of the market. Even if you take, uh, say we are not talking about the backpack industry, but then they are also an essential part in the tourism. All over the world, even in the United States, backpack tourism is something that gives uh, the economy the run. So we had a concept earlier that we should encourage only high spending tourists. We jacked up the hotel rates and we lost the industry. So the industry should be open for the market to decide the rates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then people will come. There is the, uh, the other notion if, when we are talking about tourism uh, as well. We, d we as a country, Sri Lanka, uh, when you take the region, we have the competitors in, uh, in Thailand, in Bangkok, in Singapore. We do not get the big spenders here. Uh, it's because of the fact that they go to other countries which give them, the, uh, give them what exactly they want. How can we turn that around and bring them here? Wh what kind of things should well, be done? Facilities should be offered what the tourist wants, right? But uh, we should not go to the extent of uh, going into, now even Singapore has started SANS. Mm -hmm. Okay, that attracts a lot of people, right? Thailand is totally out of it, but Thailand has its own attractions. So like that, they're country specific now. Uh, if you take uh, India, right? They have their own theme, but then there are a lot to see in India, but then it's a huge country. We have better things to offer in a smaller place. You can uh, right now go to Norelia, it's winter there. It's four degrees, right? Then you spend another five hours coming, five hours coming down to the south, you are in bright sunshine. These days it's about 35 degrees, 36 degrees, clear skies. So this is the only country that you can give winter and then a change in four hours to the sea. I mean, the, the sea. So that kind of thing is what people appreciate and they look for. And then we have, we talk of a heritage of maybe 2,500 years, but when you go to the other countries in the world, they have five, 6,000 years of heritage. Right. Those are all preserved in those countries. The government gets revenue. Mm -hmm. They don't have anything free, but right. they sell a ticket and that, that uh, fund is utilized for maintenance of that mm -hmm. place. Now here, this our collection goes to the central fund and the central fund doesn't, I mean, you go to any place in this country, you go to historic sites or you go to any place, it's all totally neglected and right. say you have a, a big uh, signage there in English, but the English is written by like some people in the, in the fourth standard. So all those things have to be corrected by professionals. I think on that note, we'd, uh, it's time for us to take a short break, but uh, thank you very much, Mr. Jayavira, for your insights and the positivity on First at Nine. Well, we take a short break. We'll be back with your other headline-making stories right after. Thank you. are watching Sri Lanka's number one news channel. This is Other Therana 24. Welcome back everyone, uh, let's move on with the other local stories we have for you tonight. A new memorandum of understanding on the agreed daily wage hike of plantation workers was inked today. The government recently held discussions with the Plantain Plantation Owners Association and the trade unions on a possible wage hike and all parties arrived at a common consensus to raise the daily wage to 700 rupees, 300 rupees below their initial demand of 1000 rupees. Plantation workers unhappy with the agreed scale of wage increment, meanwhile, continue to protest. A new memorandum of understanding on the daily wage of plantation workers was signed today. 
Arumugam Thondaman representing the Ceylon Workers Congress, the Director General of the Plantation Owners Association and State Minister of Plantation Industries, Suresh Vadivel signed the MOU. Following which the agreement was handed over to Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe by non-cabinet Minister of Labour and Trade Union Relations, Ravindra Samaravira. <laughs> It is agreed upon to increase the daily wage of plantation workers to 700 rupees. After this agreement being gazetted in another two, three days, the basic daily wage will be increased to 700 rupees with a 50 rupee incentive, which makes their daily wage 750 rupees. Leader of the Ceylon Workers' Congress, Arumugam Thundaman, also expressed views regarding the wage increase. We have negotiated with the companies. The nine days when workers are on strike will be taken as national days. Apart from that, all police cases put during those periods will be withdrawn. Any action taken or anybody dismissed or suspended will be restored. We will have a subcommittee which will meet to address issues which come up on and off. We have wanted 1,000 rupees. But when you go for a collective bargaining, there's a give and take policy. So in that way, they have come up and we have come down. As far as we are concerned, we feel we have got a fair wage increase. But if somebody feels they can get better, we are ready to support them. However, a group of plantation workers engaged in a protest in front of the Employees' Federation of Ceylon in Rajagiriya this morning, demanding that the daily wage of plantation workers be increased to 1,000 rupees before the settling for 700 rupees. Meanwhile, various protests were conducted by plantation workers today who stuck to their demand of a thousand rupee daily wage. Opposition leader Mahinda Rajapaksa once more expressed his wonder as to what was done by the government with the money it obtained by way of loans since it came to power. After attending a religious ceremony in Colombo this morning, the opposition leader responded to questions raised by journalists saying that the government's achievements do not reflect the sums of loans it had obtained. In response to a query, he also raised concerns over... Um, the U.S. fleet, um, that uh, aircraft movements in Sri Lanka, while flagging concerns on national security. An aircraft from any country entering into another without permission and leaving is completely wrong. It raises concerns over national security. That is also against the law of the country. When we were ruling the country, the whole country knew for what purpose any particular loan was taken. The unfortunate thing is that the current government has already drawn out the sum which we took. But no one can say what was done for the country with that money. In business news, a sharp slowdown in spending on imports, especially cars, helped narrow Sri Lanka's trade deficit in November last year from a year ago with exports growing uh, by 4.1% to 980 million US dollars. The central bank said spending on imports contracted by 9.1% in November 2018 to $1.77 billion. However, on a cumulative basis, the deficit in the trade account expanded during the first 11 months of 2011 to $9.64 billion from $8.6 billion in the same period of 2017. The central bank said the growth in exports was driven mainly by the increased volume rather than the price compared to the volume and unit value indices in November 2017. Expenditure on merchandise imports declined by 9.1 percent year on year for the first time since June 2017 to 1.76 million dollars in November 2018. Well, speaking at a symposium today, Sri Lanka's central bank governor went on to say that social enterprises have an important role to play in driving and stimulating economic growth of the country. In this context, the governor called for concerted efforts to establish policies and systems that will support the growth of the emerging social enterprise sector in the island nation. Now, social enterprise is recognized as an important business model that applies new commercial strategies to maximize the improvements in financial, social and environmental well-being of a nation. 
The government has set out the policy direction, the challenges to be addressed, and the intervention strategies to be pursued to achieve regionally balanced growth as well as resource efficiency in developing SMEs. These initiatives have so far yielded encouraging outcomes. However, I believe Sri Lanka still has a great deal of untapped potential in developing short social enterprises. To achieve this more dynamic approach, which entails the combined effort of all stakeholders, including both the state and private entities, while following a cohesive policy framework is required to match available resources with the needs of this sector. Concerted effort is needed to establish policies and systems to support the growth of the emerging social enterprise sector in Sri Lanka, which will assist social entrepreneurs to lead social change by stimulating economic growth, innovation, and the development of social capital. Let's take you to the stock market now at the Columbus Stock Exchange. The all share price index closed down 0.08% or 4.84 points to 5973.46 4, 5, The more liquid stocks in the S&P SL20 index were up 0.20% or 6.02 points. Market turnover was 465.3 million rupees with net foreign inflows of 192.2 million rupees. Here is Nissan Sala Kurupumudali from First Capital holdings with a full report. Market ended in red reverting to the negative sentiment, mainly dragged down by HNB and LIOC, while 63% of turnover was derived from crossings made in central finance. The net foreign inflow was witnessed amidst low foreign participation. The central bank bond auction calendar, which was published on Friday, was amended today, announcing that central bank will conduct an auction on 31st Jan instead of 12th February. The market reacted anxiously to the change in the bond auction calendar, with selling interest mainly centered on 15-12-2023. Well, world shares slipped into the red today with equities market from Europe to Asia buffered uh, by nerves over China's economy and investors saying uh, cautious ahead of a week packed with major events. Right. Major currencies, European bows fell in morning trade, mirroring a retreat for Asian peers as gloomy data on China's industrial profits outweighed any boost from the tentative end to the U.S. government shutdown late last week. Week. At the start of a busy week, investors were focused on Sino-US trade talks and the Federal Reserve's policy meeting. Also in focus was a looming twist in Britain's uh, exit from the European Union with crucial votes due tomorrow in the British Parliament designed to break the Brexit deadlock. The MSCI World Equity Index, which tracks uh, shares in 47 countries, was down 0.1%, and MSCI's main European index dropped 0.5%, with the broader euro stock 600 losing the same. Major indexes in France, Germany, and Britain all fell. In Asia, bows in Shanghai, Hong Kong, Tokyo, and Seoul had earlier all closed down, though MSCI's broadest index of Asia-Pacific shares outside Japan was flat. Meanwhile, the dollar is to get a strong steer from this week's Fed meeting, where the U.S. Central Bank is expected to signal a pause in its tightening cycle and to acknowledge growing risks to the world's biggest economy. Uh, though the Fed has forecast two more interest rate hikes for 2019, a darkening global economy outlook and highly volatile stock markets have clouded the policy picture. Oil fell 1% after U.S. companies added rigs for the first time this year, a signal that crude output may rise further. But the price is still on course for its strongest gain in the month of January for 14 years. The ongoing trade dispute uh, between United States and China looks unlikely to end anytime soon, and the impact of the dispute on the Chinese economy is increasing. Brent crude oil futures were down $1.14 at $60.50 a barrel, while U.S. futures were down $1.05 at $52.64 a barrel. Traders have said that the U.S. crude production, which hit a record 11.9 million barrels per day last year has undermined sentiment in the oil market. U.S. energy firms last week increased the number of rigs looking for new oil for the first time since late December to 862. The much of the demand outlook hinges on China and whether or not its refiners will continue to import crude at 2018's breakneck pace.
and Sri Lanka's rupee closed stronger at 185.55 to 65 against the US dollar in spot market today while bond yields were largely unchanged and um, the market uh, outlook was positive. Here's a look at how uh, foreign, tra foreign currencies traded against the US dollar today. International news now. The U.S. has warned Venezuela that any threat against American diplomats or opposition leader Juan Guaido will be met with a significant response. National Security Advisor John Bolton said any such intimidation would be a grave assault on the rule of law. Now, his warning comes days after the U.S. and more than 20 other countries recognized Venezuelan opposition leader Guaido as interim president. He declared himself the interim president on January 23rd and the, and the political crisis in Venezuela now appears to be reaching boiling point amidst growing efforts by the opposition to unseat President Nicolas Maduro. Maduro broke off relations with the U.S. late Thursday over the country's support for Guaido and ordered U.S. envoys to depart Venezuela within 72 hours. However, on Saturday evening, as the deadline was due to expire, Venezuela's foreign ministry said it would withdraw the expulsion order and instead allow 30 days for the two sides to set up interest offices in each other's countries. Interest officers are used when countries do not have formal diplomatic relations but want to have a basic level of contact to represent their interests. Russia, China, Mexico and Turkey have publicly backed President Nicolas Maduro. At a UN Security Council meeting on Saturday, Russia accused Washington of plotting a coup. Several European countries, including Spain, Germany, France and the UK, however, said that they would recognize Guaido as president if elections were not called within eight days. But Maduro has rejected this, saying the ultimatum must be withdrawn. Well, the pilot of a plane that crashed in Nepal last March seemed to have an emotional breakdown according to a final report into the disaster. The flight carrying 71 people from Dhaka in Bangladesh caught fire as it landed in Kathmandu, killing 51 people. It was initially thought that uh, poor communication with air traffic control may have been to blame. But investigators now say the pilot was uh, ranting to crew members and even smoking in the cockpit due to stress. Nepal's Accident Investigation Commission said in its report that the cap captain of U.S. Bangla Airlines flight BS-211 was very much emotionally disturbed and stressed because a female colleague was not on board the plane, had uh, questioned his reputation as a good flight instructor. Now, the 52-year-old pilot was released from the Bangladeshi Air Force in 1993 because of depression, the report said, but was later declared fit to fly civilian aircraft. Uh, recent medical reports had not mentioned any symptoms. The report also added that the 25-year-old first officer may have been reluctant to be more assertive during uh, the final approach and landing because of the captain's experience and authority. A small sh break on the other side. We'll have sports news. Stay with us. are watching Sri Lanka's number one news channel. This is Adhatherana 24.
And before we wrap up tonight's edition, we have sports news. Head of the International Cricket Council's Anti-Corruption Unit, Alex Marshall, applauds and expresses gratitude for Sri Lankan players coming forward to share information regarding corrupt activities within the country's cricket governing body, Sri Lanka Cricket. Well, releasing a statement, he says that a positive response was seen with several people providing new and important information, adding that it assisted the ongoing investigation also resulting in some new cases. He also urged the cricket fraternity to come forward and share any other information concerning the corrupt conduct for approaches without any fear or repercussion. The International Cricket Council offered an amnesty period to Sri Lanka players to own up to any involvement in corrupt activities, breach of conduct or to reveal information on player behaviour tarnishing the spirit of the game. A host of scandals now have rocked the Sri Lanka cricket in recent years including match fixing controversies. The country's uh, cricket governing body was identified by the ICC as the most corrupt of all among cricket playing nations. And that's all the news we have tonight. Thank you for joining us. Uh, if you did miss any of our stories, do log on to www.otherderana.lk. I'm Indeebari Amwanta. And I'm Mahesh Johnny. Thank you for making us a part of your evening. Have a good night.